Uh, we do have a meeting coming up in October. Uh, our next one is scheduled for October 17th, and at that date, uh, here at the Mudville Grill, we will be having elections for new board members as well as people uh, who will hold office. The officers that are here today, we have Matt Ray, Vice President. Where's Matt? Back in the back. Mary Jo Drinkler, Secretary. All the RSVPs went through her. Beverly Campbell, Treasurer. Howard Kelly, board member and webmaster. <laughs> Harry Reagan, founder of this illustrious organization. <laughs> John Harrell, just a board member. <laughs> Tommy Riggins, somebody working behind the scenes getting things ready for this event tonight, as well as many of them. And Becky Ganey is also should be recognized, although she's not on the board, but we treat her like she's the one because she's been helping with the name tags and such. So a reminder, our final luncheon of the year is October 17th. It is at that meeting we hold elections and we encourage people to uh, to put their names uh, in the run. Mike Lyons has already volunteered to, to run for a board member position and we appreciate that. Anyone else who wants to run, let me know because I'll be putting up the uh, election ballots at that time. We always want to uh, hear from you as well about the topics this is a very special topic today uh, that we knew that we would get a good crowd, and it's a lovely looking crowd, in fact. And we appreciate your being here today. Uh, I'm sure it's a busy day for you, but it's nice to have you here to help honor uh, the man that's behind me, or both men behind me. Thank you. <laughs> Camille DeLeon is doing our video work today. Everything working? Okay, that's fine. I'm not important. Okay. You're the one I know. Today's program is about the man, the myth, and the legend. <laughs> and we're not talking about John Gunn. <laughs> yet. He's still got a few more years to go before he reaches that status. But he is Becky's favorite meteorologist. And our cat's favorite meteorologist. <laughs> and um, we love, you know, following Channel 4 during the uh, any hurricane, because we know that they know what's going on. He's just not as funny as Richard Nunn. <laughs> so hosting this is John Gunn, and here's George Winterling. Thank you, Richard. I think Richard just thinks Richard's funny because they both have the same first name, but that's me. All right, so here is the legend. And not much of a myth anymore, George, because you've written a book. How long did it take you to put this book together, and did you have ideas of this book for a very long time? Well, the idea didn't come to me until I finished writing material in my computer. <laughs> and when I got to an, uh, writing an index to all of the chapters, over 40 of them, said, this looks like this is either a movie or a book or something. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, as I go to bed each night, at my age, you say your prayers. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it just came to me. The Lord just told me that this should be printed in a book. And uh, there are other people, not just family members, that will probably be here after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. There are other people that will probably find things that they can find that are similar to what they experienced growing up. And so it's been an all-around good uh, experience of having my res the responses that I'm getting to the book. Uh, I would imagine the responses have been very positive. And, and I think from my own personal point of view, when I was reading your book, it's 155 pages. And when I got to the first 100, it took me about three, four hours, because I really went slow and easy. And in those first 100 pages, you really kind of broke down who was George Winling and how you grew up and the beginnings that you had here in Jacksonville and New Jersey and the like. Why did you spend so much time on that at that point in time? Did you really feel like you had to get a message to the, your family, or was it a message to the public? Where were you wanting to go there? I think mainly that was running to figure out where I came from and where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And I had to spend a lot of time going back to the family history and after all, it was 1941 that I came to Florida. But before you were 10 years old, 
all of those memories are still just as alive, and they were just memories, because the only time I went to New Jersey was to visit my grandmother twice. And uh, so I was trying to recreate that, not only for myself, but for my children and my grandchildren. And uh, let's go to my questions here for you, George, because you see I really broke down your book, and I want you to know this is called an iPhone. <laughs> and the point of it is, if you have an iPhone, I have a new phone. A new phone, I love it. And in my list of things here, George, I want you to understand, I really went through all of this. I have pages and pages of questions here that I want to ask. But I'm going to start with a simple one question about, why did you name the book Chasing the Wind? I, when I first th heard that, I almost felt that you had not gotten to some point in your life, because you're still chasing something that's not really, you, can, you can't grab wind, can you? Or what were you thinking? Well. That phrase somehow came in my mind. The first thing I did, I looked it up in the Bible, and Solomon said it was vanity to chase the wind. And I thought, well, what does a meteorologist do? He's trying to figure out where the weather's coming from and where it's going and try to forecast it. But then when I got into meteorology, the first thing that impressed me was the barometer. Now, where did I first hear of that? That was with a hurricane that hit the Galveston in 1900, Isaac Klein's hurricane. And they had evacuated those homes in Galveston. The tide had come up to the second floor, and people were swimming in the streets, hanging on to telephone poles. Well, let's, let's talk about Isaac's big message here. What, this is a, one of the early day meteorologists, Galveston, Texas. And if you don't know the full story here, this is the most killer hurricane in U.S. history, and up to maybe 10,000 people passed away. So when you were talking about his message, we'll, we'll, we'll tell us a little bit more as you remember Isaac's story. Well, they were talking about the in this house and watching the people trying to find safety. A lot of them were drowning, and some of them were in the upper, upper floors. When there was an old man in the house, he had a barometer. Now, this is back in 1900. And he was watching the needle on the barometer. It was getting lower and lower and lower. And the storm was getting worse and worse. And they were really concerned for their safety. And all of a sudden, he said, it has stopped falling. And he said, it started rising. And they were all relieved. Because when the barometer started rising, that meant the hurricane was moving away. And so the next I remember about barometers, when I learned how to plot the weather maps when I went into meteorology. What we do, we plotted the weather station reports of all the barometers, not just around the United States, but the world barometers, the Pacific Ocean, the ship reports from the Atlantic, and draw the isobars connecting equal pressures. So this gets back to Chasing the Wind, and that's your beginning, and that's why you named the book Chasing the Wind. Chasing the Wind. The wind. Okay. So, you mentioned that you were plotting these. Your beginnings, in terms of when you were here in Jacksonville, and I'm not going to give a lot of it away. And if you haven't read his book, you should really read through, like I said, the first 100 pages. It tells a lot about the legend and the myth in terms of where he was in his beginnings and now how he developed himself through the 1960s and 70s. I really love that part of this, the book, to be honest with you, George. I went through the last 50 pages in about 10 minutes <laughs> because it was all meteorology. It was a lot of meteorology. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about the family and stuff. But I really appreciated the fact that you opened up in those first 100 pages and taught us a lot about who you are. And when you were talking about how, and to know a little more background if you don't know this full story, is George went into the Air Force, basically out of high school, right? Right. And as you did go to the Air Force, you went to San Antonio, right. to Illinois, right. to Alaska, right. back down to Georgia. And when you got to Georgia, you would travel back and forth between Georgia and Jacksonville. Where, where was that again in, in, in Georgia? Albany, Georgia. Oh, Albany, Georgia, yeah. And you would hit your ride. They called it Albany, Albany up there. Albany. The New York yeah. of Albany. That's true. I'll remember that now. It's not Albany. Not, not like Duval. It's Duval. Duval. <laughs> How does that go, George? <laughs> One more time, George. How does it go? Duval. Duval. There you go. But you were coming back from Albany one of those nights, 
and you felt like you had a presence of God and it changed your life. What was that all about? Well, I was walking from the, my lives, I was hitchhiking, I would lay out downtown, I had to walk through the streets in the starry skies, and I was walking toward where my mother was living, and all of a sudden I saw the stars, and the, they looked like the stars were just coming from the sky. And all of a sudden I just felt like there's a calling in my future. And the only thing I could gather was it says, well, go to your church, and there you will learn. And that's where I learned the Bible, and uh, the, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible just came out. I was assigned to Alaska, and I, I ordered one, but before I arrived at the station in Alaska, the book hadn't come. And when I did get it, my goal was to read the Bible from the beginning, Genesis, all the way through the Old and the New Testament to Revelation. And as I was on the plane leaving Alaska, I was reading the last chapter in Revelation. But that night is the night you, you gave yourself to Jesus Christ when you were right. near your mom's house. But in my mind, when I read that part of your book, I felt that that was the def one of the defining moments for you personally as you made that declaration. And like you said, you went to Alaska, and how do we pronounce that location? What was it? She Shemya. 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 And one of the interesting, funny lines in the book, and I thought, you know, where does George Winterling's garden begin? Where does George Winterling's humor begin? And it was this line here in the book, and you said something to the extent that you were talking about getting based out there, and what was it called again? Shemya. Shemya. And we were talking to another airman or something, and he said, he said to you, don't worry, there's a, there's a girl behind every tree, but on the island, how many trees were there? There were no trees. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we find the beginnings of George Winning's humor, <laughs> which is pretty classic. And uh, speaking of which, you know, when, we, when I was reading a little further along in the book and understanding about, about your beginnings here in Jacksonville, I never knew that you worked at a local downtown theater. Right. And tell us a little bit. Did, I mean, to me, another impacting moment for you and who you became later on, because this is in the 50s, how, how was it that impacting for you? Well, there was no television in the 1950s, 1940s when I worked at the theater. Mm -hmm. And so I could study a lot of every film. If we saw, being an usher, we saw the films five or ten times because they played for four or five days before another film would come. And I noticed I learned a lot of the exchange between the characters and the, the stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I learned how people reacted to it. Sometimes I'd wait for the funny part of the movie and I was, knew it was coming. And I could see how people were setting themselves up for it. So I recognized a lot about dealing with people and what people were interested in just by working in the movie theater. And again, there's a technical side of movies that I feel like you really developed and made who you are as a legend in terms of meteorology and broadcasting. And that was when we flash forward about another 15 years later, and now you are at Channel 4, and you were working with film. And what was your, in my mind, the big breakaway here for you was you use film in so many different ways, including like stop action. Mm -hmm. Was that something you gained from that experience that you had, or was it just something you've seen somewhere else? Well, when I started at Channel 4, I had a home movie camera, a Sears Tower camera, they called it. It had a lever on it to click the movie film one frame at a time. So I set it on a tripod and started clicking one frame at a time, and I noticed how the clouds just looked like they were moving uh, super fast. And so that's what I did with the camera at Channel 4. Mm -hmm and they used the, the films to do other things with the weather. I took the weather maps and I made cutouts and things like that and placed them on a weather map and then I'd move them a bit and click a frame and move it again so then I could animate different motions. In fact, when it comes to the fire season and there are places in the country where the fire danger was high, the map was red, the camera was on a tripod and I got lighter fluid with a piece of glass over the map. I put lighter fluid where the fires were and lit the lighter fluid and clipped it 
camera and they use all these flames popping up. <laughs> now that's done with the computers. Right. <laughs> now we don't do that because people will call and go, oh my God, there goes the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then they hashtag it with that fake news. Yeah. But look, George, I thought that that was an, another huge moment. Did you see any other meteorologists? This is like 1963, four or five. You're doing this. Was, was anybody else out there really even performing these kind of tricks? Uh, I think there were different stations. I would probably remember the numbers. They used to have the reflectors on, magnetic on the map. And they had a wheel that rotated in front of the lights. And with the polarizing of that wheel, those reflectors would have the rain coming down from the clouds and the sun shooting out the sunbeams. And so that was animation. That, that did as well, right. Yeah. And it was a great gimmick. We watched it. Yeah, absolutely. And that was all before we had really truly color television, too. Right. Um, but when did we go color at Channel 4? 1967. And uh, we had been doing black and white. In fact, when we got to color, before color, I realized I could wear the same color tie every day and nobody would know the difference. It's funny, George, I feel the same way today. And we really got a manager who would send us to Ivy's and we could buy these shirts, all different colors, red, orange, purple, green, and the ties, they were twice as wide as the original ones. And uh, so people we could see them on the on color, the trouble is most of the people were watching in black and white, mm -hmm. so they didn't notice a difference. They, they just saw the ties getting wider and wider. And yeah, very nice. All right, so let's go back to what you know becomes a defining moment for you. You decided to leave the Weather Bureau, and you're making some decisions about you and your family, and you thought you might go to try broadcasting, but broadcasting was a tough decision for you because it was actually a pay cut from what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. And so describe that decision making. It was a tough one, I'm sure, because you had at least one, two kids, you had two boys at this point. Two boys. Yeah. And, and my daughter, daughter was just, she was born at, just after I started at Channel 4. Actually, a fun little trivial note here, and I'm not sure if this is George's humor playing, but when I was reading the book, and you'll see this line, George started on June 10th? Oh, June 9th. Uh, 22nd? 11th or 12th, I can't remember. Somewhere in there. Yeah. But he writes in the book, he said, nine months later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Something happened. George, what happened nine months that later? That was in baby Wendy Gale was born. Wendy Gale was born. <laughs> okay, so, getting, <laughs> so all the changes that were taking place, why did you make the decision to leave the Weather Bureau where you were doing extremely well with? You were top of your class back in Air Force school, school, and there's all indications you're going to do really well there at the National the World, where would be the National World Service. Yeah. So why the move? Well, it got a little boring because a lot of the work was routine. Mm -hmm. And logging all the web observations and reports, we punched them down on punch cards to go to the center that was recording all the weather data. And uh, then I was assigned as quality control officer to well, the briefing for the pilots all of a sudden they wanted the FAA to start briefing the pilots when they came in the air. And well, they just didn't let anybody brief a pilot, so I had to give them weather tests. And then I had just gone through the year before flying into Hurricane Gracie with the Hurricane Hunters, and I uh, realized how significant that was. And uh, then I wanted to... What was so significant about that particular event? Just being in the hurricane and the radar and the airplane bouncing up and down, most of the half of the crew was getting sick, and I was having a tent ball just to enjoy it. <laughs> we were flying over 900 feet above the ocean. Mm. And it's 900 feet because four years earlier, a plane was flying at 500 feet, and it's the only one that's ever gone into the ocean and never flown. Right. But uh, after that, I went to, I found a picture of the radar scope, and it wasn't very really clear. And I took it to Bert Rozelle, who was at Channel 12, and said, why don't you show this on TV? And he looked at it, and what was the hurricane on there was so difficult to distinguish. It was just a gray against the black background. He shook his head. And, uh, but so the radar wasn't it. But on your trip there, I'm going to look up a word that I had for this, because I was really impressed 
that you dealt with this and didn't break, you brought it up in the book, but I never really understood, but what is a, what did you call it, a prop, prop runaway, runaway prop, prop. runaway prop, runaway prop. All right, so the agent starts racing, and as they went so long, when those blades could go flying off, in fact, there was one of them that hit someone who killed them here just last year in an airliner. Right, exactly. But that happened while you were like literally in the eye of the hurricane or just coming out. Yeah, they just come out of the eye and we're just going into the worst part of the hurricane where the plane was bouncing all around and lightning was flashing all over the place. And then all of a sudden above the thunder and the lightning you could hear that engine. And the crew was telling me, he says, get away from the window, get away from the window. And then all of a sudden the next time I looked the propeller had stopped and all the blades were just in a stationary position. But that kind of put it into the, the flight out there, you had to come back at that point. And we came back earlier, and then we went out there for eight hours instead of the 12 long hours. hours. Yeah. hours yeah. So again, this happened before you were at broadcasting, so why did you decide, I mean, that's pretty exciting, you're getting a lot of opportunities here, and you're in the Brother Bureau, and yet you decided to make the decision to go into broadcasting, so. Well, I thought I'd try to, well, some of the new lawyers had come to the brother, and uh, radio people would come to the weather bureau and they would do interviews about the weather, uh, but they didn't know all the background into the meteorology. And I said, well, I said, well, they need somebody who knows meteorology on TV. First thing I did, I went down and tried an audition at Channel 4, and back in those days, they didn't have videotape, it was live. They had the management sitting somewhere in the dark. <laughs> They're still there. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. But even but when I got through, they said, well, don't call us, I'll call you. <laughs> Classic. So there was an opening down in Tampa at w WFLA, and I went down there and did the same thing and got the same message, don't call us, don't call you. So two years later, I, well, after that, I said, I've got to learn how to polish up what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't talk in meteorological terms because of Joe Blow and Mary, whatever, was sitting in the living room, and you don't explain isobars and barometric pressure, things like that. And so I promised up talking about in terms of rain, rain, sun, sky, sunset. And uh, so I practiced that not only in my home, but in the car when I'm driving, I'd be describing the weather. And in my home, I had one of the large weather maps from the fax machine posted around the wall, and I practiced talking in front of that map. Now, I got that idea from one of our meteorologists at the Weather Bureau. Most of them would just read the teletype copy and read the forecast and read the weather summary. He would look at the weather map and he would start talking about the weather all around. Well, it's turning cold up across the northeast, and uh, our hot weather here is going to come to an end when this cold front comes through. I said, that's what you need to explain. Sure. So I practiced reporting the weather that way. You said something a few minutes ago, and I was reading through your book, and I was, I'm going to actually pull up my notes because it was so impressive to me. What you described a few moments ago was that there was all these questions coming to you at the Weather Bureau from the TV stations about how the weather was. And during this period of time, this is the late 50s into the early 60s, I wrote down how many weather events had occurred that you wrote about in your book. And it was, you didn't sum it all up, but I did. And I was shocked to see the combination. In the late 50s through the mid 60s, there was huge weather years in weather in Florida, Georgia. Before Dora, before Dora, there were two severe nor'easters, yep. two severe cold outbreaks, including a severe freezing rain event, a severe flooding event at Black Creek, which caused severe flooding, two major hurricanes in Pack, Florida, Donna and Chloe, and this is all before Dora. So did you think that that helped to inspire you? All those weather events, the broadcast stations coming to you guys, did that help spur you on? I mean, it was a timing thing here. It wasn't just, you know, when I look at the big picture of what made George Winterling, I'm trying to find all the puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces, and I find that this one was really interesting because there were so many major weather events prior to Dora, and you were all a part of that. Well, I remember we had a weather Log, the weather bureau, was written by Walter Bennett, who used to be, in fact, he was Charles Bennett's father. 
he was a meteorologist, and he had logged all the significant weather events from the snow we had in May 19, 1899, and the uh, nor'easters. Remember, the severe nor'easters came about every 30 years. 1947, and then came the bad one in 1962. When the one in 62 came, I knew it was going to be worse than all the others, so I just wrote on the top of the weather map for the camera a real northeaster. And uh, that's the one that caused $2 million damage at Jacksonville Beach. So uh, all of those events stood out, and it turned out two weeks after that, we had the coldest temperature since 1899. It dropped down to 12 degrees. The TV stations on the floor, the water froze in the cooling towers. And that's the first I've ever heard of that. Right. So those are significant events. And so those seem to spark the interest in weather. And then the, the, that freeze was the one that one of our cameramen came in with the pictures from his movie camera of seagulls trying to land on Cedar Creek. And the seagulls had hit the ice that was frozen over. And they skied across. And a piece of ice would be thrown out there and they'd chase it and slide and fall off. So uh, that, that was very unique. So again, it was, I'm looking for the confluence of events that came together to help provide the next big event for you in your life. And I know it's not Wendy Gale, but in this case it was Dora in the fall of 64. So talk, about, talk to us a little bit. I mean, I've read all about it, but is there something that you may have left out of the book or what you would like to people to look at inside the book when it comes to Dora that may have been left out or emphasized? Well, it was interesting that the reason why I caused so much attention to Dora because it came was that 10 days before that, Hurricane Cleo hit Miami it surprised Miami. The weather bureau had told people that this, this, don't worry, the storm would pass offshore, and it turned out it didn't. They got 135 mile an hour wind gusts, and there was a big investigation by Senator Smathers as to what happened. And they explained that it was just the warm water right there off of Biscayne Bay that just gave extra energy to that hurricane and increase those winds, and people woke up with some of their windows shattered and things like that. Well, uh, the next thing was it was moving northward toward Jacksonville. And of course, all the emphasis was that Jacksonville was on a hurricane warning. Well, we stayed up all night long as I've reported on, on the map that I posted each position of the hurricane, and it turned out that it stayed just inland from the ocean, all the way up to Daytona Beach. Just before Daytona Beach, the weather bureau said that uh, it was 30 miles off the coast, and they were really concerned with a hurricane warning. Uh, Daytona came in with a south wind at 55 miles an hour. South meant the storm was still inland, west over land. So I said, no, we don't have to worry about it. As long as it's over land, it's going to continue to dwindle. And as it was, the peak wind was only 75 just at the beach. And then we only had 47 miles an hour land. And again, this is all prior to Dora. And again, I'm looking for this, this stage that was perfectly set up for Dora, because in this case, you, in some ways, gathered some confidence in yourself, because here you are telling everybody exactly what really happened with Chloe, and yet, that is to say the National Weather Service was off in this case. They headed over the ocean, they headed out to the east, but you knew better and you kept the calmness by saying, hey look, it's not gonna be as bad here. So now we head towards Dora and the prognostications of the early were for where was Dora gonna go? Yeah, well, but then I realized that when a hurricane warning goes up, would anybody pay attention to it? Mm -hmm. So I explained what's our worst hurricane danger. I should be one that came in straight from the Atlantic and right into our coast. And I didn't think that that one was going to come in this way the day before that storm was out there because it was so far out, it, most of them turned north. But it started coming toward our coast. And everybody was interested in Cape Canaveral because they had shut down. Uh, I said no, so it's Cape Canaveral. Most of them would move a little bit farther north. And what did that do? That pointed right at St. Augustine. So I was checking the barometric pressure at Daytona Beach. As long as it's falling, it's moving in the general direction of St. Augustine. The weather bureau came out with a statement that it was moving northwest, 
past St. Augustine. And I, when I reported that, I gave them credit for it. But I said, no, I said, the student were enjoyed saying that St. Augustine, and they did. Right. And it get, gets back to air pressure. Yep. And so in some ways, it is all about chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. That's right. All right. Once again, here's George's book. Remind all your relatives and friends that they can get this. And George, you're donating the money from the proceeds of this book, too. And I forgot who it was. With some children talking. As we probably should figure. One last comment from someone. I'm told Tim Deegan wanted to say something. Wow. That's what Robert Kelly told me. <laughs> My boss said I need to say something. I need to say something. Um, well, um, I don't want to take up too much time. I could go on for hours, George. I should probably just say thank you. Uh, I remember when I first moved here in 1982, and uh, within months, uh, I would hear comments about this other guy doing the weather. And it wasn't the chief meteorologist at Channel 4, it wasn't even George Ridley, it was George. I mean, even back in 82, if you said George, I don't care what station you watched, you knew who people were talking about. You knew what people were talking about. You knew it was about meteorology. So for that reason, I, I told a guy in, in, the, in my neighborhood today uh, that if there is a one, if there's one word, I think John would agree with me, if there's one word, that you could use that would say, answer the question, why do you meteorologists get paid? It would be yours. Uh, I, I've learned so many things from you, George, uh, and, 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 and I can hear, hear my wife already saying, just Tim, just say he's a Seminole and that's enough. <laughs> For uh, ten years or so, whatever, and um, and uh, you know, management paid for consultants, and they still do. Don't know why. Um, <laughs> but the consultants, George, you know, I love them. The consultants use George. Now this is by '92. The consultants use George as this is what we don't want you to do. And what I took away from that was, wait a second. Here's a guy who's a scientist on TV. He's his own person. Um, he's authentic, people trust him, and, and he's, he's the guy. That's, that's what I continue to learn from you. Two other things, and I'll shut up. Um, you, brought, you brought up isobars. Um, I loved isobars even as a kid. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, to me, people would say, well, Tim, what do you think about the Weather Channel when first started? And I would say, they got isobars. I mean, tell me it was amazing. You had isobars. I used isobars. 2002. Uh, so I've been here for 20 years. I thought I was beginning to learn about what to do on TV. Mm -hmm. The news director says, Deegan, no more isobars. And I literally almost lost my job because I specifically said for the next five minutes, but George uses isobars. <laughs> <laughs> final note, final note. Um, and John, you probably touched on it, which is beautiful. There, there was a uh, uh, weather safety group that used to meet with George. Um, Harry Schnabel maybe set it up. And, and, and Jack. Jack, Jack. And it was specifically the idea of that supposedly people tended to listen to meteorologists. Um, we're trying to get this, um, this thing about uh, safety out to people. Why don't we have meteorologists say, talk about things that are significant for public safety? So we'd be there. Uh, and it was the first time really I, I, I'd been eyeball to eyeball with George. And we talked a lot about a lot of science, about a lot of ways to best communicate with, with things. And this was right about when global warming and the whole bit would come out. And, and, and it seemed to me at any point that there, was, that there seemed to be this thing of you either believed in science or you believed in God. And this guy would finish every meeting, a little brief, quiet as could be, a little prayer. And I just thought that was perfect. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, John. Thank you, George, for doing such a wonderful program. We're going to have a video of that, and that will be posted very, very soon uh, on our uh, YouTube page as well as our website. And again, a reminder that uh, we always have these luncheons four times a year. Program ideas come from you, and if there's something that you would like us to have as a program in the future, please let us know. 
Uh, speaking of the website, it has a lot of the, these pictures up here are great. I, I noticed that one of the people that I worked with um, many years ago was um, uh, Mark Aldrin from Channel 17 when I was there back in the 70s. And then when I was at Channel 12 back in the 70s as well, our, our meteorologists were Dave McLaughlin and Tom Skilling. So, uh, and of course they always check George before they went on the air. <laughs> so check out the website. We have one that's a private one for our membership, so we encourage you to become a member of the JBA. And we also have one called Florida Broadcasting Memory. So a lot of the pictures that you see here, uh, we're getting a lot of videos that we're searching and we're trying to make those sites a site that you as a broadcaster can contribute to and can uh, learn from as well as the rest of the community. If you haven't paid your dues, please see Bev. She'll be out here in just a moment, and we do have at least one new member today, and that's Todd Chase. We appreciate that. Uh, he paid his $20 dues, which helps out this organization, and uh, she'll be over here in just a moment. Please uh, remember, coming up next uh, October 17th is the next luncheon, and uh, we want to thank you for coming. Please, if you remember to pay for your lunch uh, before you leave, leave your name tag. And just on a personal note, you know, those of you who are looking for Santa Claus, it's only 132 days till Christmas, so book your Santa early. Thank you.